You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Quinn C. Burlingame. Uh, we're going to be talking about a semiconductor breakthrough that uh, could be a game changer for organic solar cells. So, uh, Quinn, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Yeah, great to be here, Richard. Uh, things, just, things are going well. Well, good. Tell me a little bit about your, your background and then why the, uh, the focus on solar cells in these particular claims. Great. Um, so, I am a basically an organic electronics researcher. Um, and by organics, I mean things that contain um, primarily carbon and um, tend to be kind of high, hydrocarbon-based things. So polymers would be organic uh, materials and semiconductors. And you can also make um, smaller molecules like the ones I primarily work with, which are still carbon-based, uh, but you can either evaporate them or process them in solution to make all kinds of um, thin film devices. So um, I basically started out in research um, kind of right after my undergrad working um, just in organic electronics laboratories and, and doing that kind of research, um, I was working on all sorts of different just sort of materials um, development work. And one day I uh, heard about this idea called an organic solar cell. And these are things that have actually been uh, around for a while now. And you can essentially make a multi-layered um, electronic device out of these organic semiconductor materials. And you can make a fully functional um, solar cell. So hit it with light, and it, it creates electricity. Uh, and there's just a ton of really interesting things in physics and chemistry and material science that you can do with these devices um, to to really push them and um, and give them all kinds of applications that you can't do with uh, with other sort of solar cell devices. So I just kind of fell in love with the field and ended up uh, doing my PhD working on those devices, and now um, continuing my research. Uh, here at Princeton and, and with the startup company. So what's the difference between a, like what's an organic solar cell made of, for instance, versus a traditional solar cell? So a traditional solar cell, like the, the ones you would see out in big solar fields or on people's roofs, those are almost entirely silicon. Um, they have a, a totally dominant market share um, and they're you know pretty efficient. They're very reliable. Um, they're kind of bulky and heavy and, and big, uh, but they, they do the job very well. Um, our cells are made out of um, these tiny little organic semiconductor molecules. So they're carbon-based compounds. Um, I think the material that we're primarily going to maybe focus on today, because um, that is kind of the, the title of the podcast, is made entirely of carbon. It's called carbon-60. So it's just 60 carbon molecules, I'm sorry, 60 carbon atoms attached to each other in sort of a, a little ball. Um, it's called a buckyball or carbon-60. Um, mm -hmm. So th these are the, the kind of molecules we use. and um, because of their, you know, I think you, uh, an easy way to think of them is sort of as, as plastics. Um, those would be polymers, but um, our materials are, are very similar property-wise. They can be very thin, flexible. You can make them absorb wherever you want, sort of uh, if you want to absorb visible light with organics, no problem. If you want to absorb infrared light, no problem. If you want to absorb UV light, um, you can make them just by sort of changing them chemically. You can You can make them do just about anything you want, and you can make the devices flexible and um, they, they have just a huge application space where with, you know, silicon solar cell, these, the devices that are, you know, really um, sort of transforming our landscape and, and 
making waves with um, you know, really large scale deployment, um, they are what they are. And silicon is looks like silicon looks, and it's going to be big and heavy, and it's always going to sort of have that form factor. And those are fantastic devices that have an, a place. Um, but we're trying to kind of fill in some of the gaps and uh, put devices where silicon uh, can't really can't really get too easily. Right. So what about a um, a layered solution where you know, light is going to be incident upon a, a series of organic cells. And, um, you know, let's say the visible is captured first and then the rest of the light, it's transparent yeah. to and that filters through the next layer and it captures the UV and then, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is a, um, a concept that's out there called a tandem solar cell. And you, you can potentially make a tandem solar cell with anything um, where you have a layered structure like that. Um, and primarily, You'll, you'll put like the UV absorbing layer on, in the front because that'll absorb UV. Then you put a visible layer and then you put an infrared layer in the back. Um, and then you can essentially put all those devices in series and you can get a much higher uh, efficiency that way. So organics are, are really perfectly suited for that purpose. Um, the world record efficiency cell for an organic is currently made that way. It's got uh, two different junctions, one that's absorbing sort of the infrared and near infrared, and then another one that's absorbing um, the visible and you know up, up to uv maybe 350 or 400 nanometers light in that range um and outside of those tandems that that wavelength flexibility um, is something that we really take advantage of a lot with my my current research um so we're developing totally transparent solar cells that um, are basically imperceptible you just think you're looking at glass uh, when you look at them and that's because the organics are just absorbing the uv portion of the spectrum so we can get a nice high voltage uh, in our solar cell from those high energy um, photons in the solar spectrum, and you can totally see through it as if it's not even there. But again, what's the goal? Is it efficiency or is it being able to use them in places where traditional solar cells can't be used? Uh, so I guess speaking of the entire field of organic solar cells, it, it is the latter thing. So it's finding applications where right, if I if I just want to make as much power as possible and I don't care about the weight or appearance of my solar cell, like if I want to you know, put it on a uh, building that can support that, a silicon cell is going to be the best way to go um, cost per performance. There are definitely um, solar cells that are much higher performance, but would also be higher cost, like um, compound semiconductor stuff like gallium arsenide. Um, so the, the case that organics are making is that we can, we can potentially make them um, you know, uh, integrated into Windows. We can potentially make them easily um, basically roll-to-roll -roll process. So you can have a big sheet of organic solar cell that you can roll out on your roof. You don't have to have any additional infrastructure and it just works. Um, so it's sort of, right now, it's stretching the stretching the possibility space of where where solar can be. And in our case, it's with transparency, with other people. Um, it's, it's with total flexibility and uh, um, different applications like that. So what are some examples? Where can the organic solar cells be used, and you know what's the difference in using them? So there's still essentially a research uh, phase technology right now. Um, so what we're doing with them is making a window integrated solar cell that um, can be used to power all kinds of things. Um, and the specific target application that we think about a lot is with electrochromic uh, windows. And these are essentially um, transparent devices that you can apply a voltage to and they will then change their color. So this can be, um, there's already some application, or sorry, some uh, examples of this in like um, cars and in some uh, like airplane windows where the window itself is dimmable and you can basically have a little controller that you apply a voltage to that window and it changes color. Um, so with us, we can generate um, the power to power that element from the solar energy that's coming through the window using an organic solar cell. Um, so that's sort of a, um, an application that makes use of the advantages of absorbing UV photons, which is that you get a nice high voltage. Um, so it sort of matches that application really nicely. And um, there's other um, sort of other aspects of the technology where people are primarily absorbing the infrared spectrum. The solar spectrum has a ton of light out in that part of the spectrum, so you can get lots of efficiency. And then you can just use that power for sort of um, you know general use, um, just to supplement. Um, your your building's power. So why don't uh, so traditional solar cells? They're just capturing 
the visible spectrum or are they capturing infrared or UV? Primarily, yeah. So silicon goes out to about um, around 1,100 nanometers. So it's a little bit into the infrared. We can see out to about 740 or 750 nanometer light. Um, so silicon gets all the visible and then out um, a little bit into the into the infrared. Um, and that's essentially for a, for a single um, for a single material solar cell. That's about as good as you can do. Um, you can you can get maybe a little bit more efficiency squeezed out of it, uh, but silicon is sort of serendipitously positioned in a really good spot to have efficient solar energy generation. So again, what are the efficiencies of traditional solar versus uh, organic solar cells? Uh, so in laboratory scale, you can get silicon uh, about 26%, I believe. Um, the current world record for an organic cell is a little over 17%, and that's a multi-junction. Um, so they are, you know, soft soft materials that are um, not as efficient and currently not as reliable, which is why they're still sort of a research-based technology. Um, if you look at the trajectory that they're on, however, um, I think there's pretty good reason to believe that um, we'll be very close um, to those other technologies within a couple of years. Um, so it's really increased. Why is it different efficiency? What's what's in the mechanism by which normal solar cells work versus organic? You know, why is there an efficiency difference? So uh, the materials are totally different. So um, if you look at like the conductivity, the absorptivity, all of these things are are very different for these for the two materials. Um, a, a organic solar cell is uh, excitonic. So when you absorb light, you make an excited state um, that's called an exciton, where the electron and the positive charge stay bound to each other. And then you need to use uh, basically a, a junction between two materials to separate out that and get the, get the current. In a silicon solar cell or a normal inorganic solar cell, as soon as the light comes in, you're making the electron and the whole, uh, sorry, the electron and the positive charge at the same time, and they're already free. Um, so that saves you a little bit of energy because you don't have to pull them apart. Um, so you sort of, you, you do benefit in other ways by using the organic. So you have something that's flexible and something that's much more tunable, um, but it's also, it's, it's made of plastic. So it's not as conductive as silicon is. Um, and it's, you know, um, yeah, you, you need to do a little more a little more work to get the, the charges out of it, I suppose. Is there a trade-off? Is there a problem of charge conduction in you know traditional silicon where you have to control it or you lose part of it versus organic solar cells where you know I guess you, it stays where it's made? Um, I don't think so. So it, the the main I mean, there's so many differences between these material sets because you know, silicon is this continuously bound array of atoms that are all just you know sort of sharing. Um, electrons freely throughout throughout this entire bulk material. The organics are these isolated molecules that aren't really strongly bound together. They're sort of um, soft and squishy and, and um, not strongly bound. So one of the reasons that you would want to even use them in the first place is that the organics interact with light a lot more strongly. So if I want to absorb all the light in the visible, I can do that with maybe 100 nanometers of an organic material. Where if I want to do that in silicon, I need several microns of material. Um, so they're totally different optically. Um, but silicon does a great job. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's, it's in integrated circuits everywhere. It's a great conductor of charges. Um, so they do just fine in that sort of thick form factor. They're able to get uh, charge extracted, uh, no problem. And in organics, because their conductivity is so much lower, I think we're the ones who have to work a bit harder. And that's, um, you know, that's one of the main challenges in our field right now is to get uh, the conductivity and the, the charge mobility of organics up to a level where we can actually extract charges out of a device. Well, how do you extract them? I mean, do you let them build up for a period of time and then extract? Is it like more of a pulsed system? Or so no, so they, they, they flow, they, they're flowing out uh, continuously. So um, yeah, to, to, to really break it down, you basically have light coming in, it creates this excitonic state, which is a bound electron hole pair. Um, that exciton can sort of diffuse around, it can hop between molecules, and then it reaches this interface between two different organic molecules. So every organic solar cell has this junction of two organic molecules at it. Um, the exciton, basically um, one carrier as part of the exciton, either the electron or the positive charge, will jump across that barrier. So then you'll have one charge on one side of the junction and one side on the other, uh, one charge on the other side of the junction, and then they will separate there and then they can uh, conduct their way out. Um, 
so it's a it's quite a different sort of charge generation mechanism than than you have in other cells. So okay, where where did the uh, where does the inefficiency come in? You know, with traditional solar and organic, why is it? You know, again, I can't complain. Why is it only twenty six percent? Why is it only seventeen okay. percent? Where's where's the rest of okay. it going? Yeah, so this is a, a great question. Um, so starting with um, normal, let's say, you know, the inorganic silicon solar cell. So based on where you have the band gap or energy gap of your material, that determines how much of the solar spectrum you can uh, absorb. Hmm. So if you look at a plot of the solar spectrum, we're getting all, all this UV light way up in the high energy space, this visible light down in the sort of middle energies, and then this huge tail of infrared light that goes out um, you know, way, way up. So about, um, I think roughly 60% of the light is in the infrared, and then 40% of the light is in the visible and UV. So if I put my silicon band gap at whatever number it is, which is around 1,100 nanometers, that means I can absorb the light that's higher energy than that, but um, all that light that's beyond 1,100 nanometers, I can't touch it. It's too low energy to be absorbed by my silicon. So there's a huge amount of energy loss that happens right there because you're just not absorbing it. So you could, in theory, put out a much... um, essentially lower energy gap semiconductor, and then you would absorb more of the solar spectrum, but then you're going to be limited in voltage because of that the energy gap of the material determines how much voltage you can get out of the cell. So there's essentially an optimum of where you can place your band gap in the solar spectrum to get the, uh, you know, the most possible or the best possible combination essentially of number of photons absorbed and the voltage that you can extract those charges at. Um, and, Let's say you modulate I have, the uh, the band gap by what doping the silicon. Is that how it's done? In, in silicon, the band gap is the band gap. You, you can't really change it. Um, you, I mean, you, you can literally change it a little bit by uh, straining it and stuff, but that's not commonly done. Um, it's just silicon is what it is. If you want a, a different band gap semiconductor, you can change the semiconductor, but you're you're totally stuck with silicon. Um, in in our space, that this is like the main advantage of organics is that you can. Um, you can use organic chemistry and synthesis to just make any compound you want. You can make the energy gap of your organic semiconductor anything you want it to be. So they're super flexible um, and they can, I mean, like not not flexible mechanically, which they also are, but uh, flexible synthetically and chemically. So you can sort of shift their absorption around wherever you want it to be. So you're making a composite material of uh, organic molecules that cover a spectrum of various band gaps or, or how is it? Yeah, like- yeah, yeah. Um, so like I said, there's basically two components to every organic solar cell. So we have those two, um, materials that are on either side of the heterojunction. So I can basically, um, have the absorption of those two molecules be complementary to each other, which is great, right? So I can have one that absorbs a little bluer, one that absorbs a little redder, and then they'll, you know, they'll, they'll share nicely and they'll absorb in different parts of the spectrum and and you'll be happy. Um, and you can also make a multi-junction cell where, it's several different pairs of those materials. So you can have, they have three junctions and I would have six different organic molecules, each of which I can make absorb in whatever part of the spectrum I want. Um, and then you can really get very broad spectrum uh, coverage with your organics. But if the, okay, so if the sunlight's coming in on the Z axis, are they just side by side or are they one below another? They would be, they'd be one below. Yeah, they'd be, they'd okay. be one below. Um, so, right, exactly. So if it's coming in on the Z, your first solar cell will be in the XY plane. Um, your next solar cell will be in the XY plane below that on the Z axis. And your third one will be in the XY plane below that on the Z axis. So you, you stack them up that way. Um, otherwise, if, if I'm putting them sort of next to each other in the X axis, then I might as well just put the most efficient cell everywhere, right? There's no, yeah. there's no benefit to, yeah. How many layers can you go where you, you know, there's, there's no transmission after a while? It, it really depends on the material. Um, so with our with our basically UV absorbers, um, I can make it extremely thick. Um, I can make it you know like a big pane of glass um, before before you really notice it. Um, if you're looking at it sort of on the uh, on the peak absorption, so where an organic material absorbs very strongly, um, you can easily absorb 99% of the light um, within 100 nanometers or 50 nanometers of the material. Um, so they do interact really, really strongly um, with light, which is why they're such great optical materials. So do you end up making a sandwich of three layers, or more often than not, you just make one layer that absorbs the most strongly? So uh, in a in a practical device, I would say the minimum you'll ever see is, um, let's see, so you have a bottom electrode, 
you have what we call a whole transport layer, which conducts your positive charge. You have the donor and the acceptor, which are these two um, organic materials in the heterojunction that I keep talking about. So those are two layers. Uh, and then you have a top layer, which is an electron transport layer. And then you have an electrode on top, which is usually metal or something like that. Um, and for you know for an app, for a transparent application, it would be something other than metal. Um, but I, I think the kind of minimum viable structure you'll normally see is a six layer like that. So two electrodes, two transport layers, and the, and the donor acceptor. And for every junction you add, it sort of you know doubles that. So you you can get um, very complicated multi-layer uh, structures that if you want to get up into those sort of high efficiency uh, multi-junction structures. And what about the layer thickness, the absorbing layer? I mean, it's, uh, I guess there's a sweet spot in how thick it should be, right, for maximum absorption? Yeah, exactly. Um, so it, it, again, depends on the materials. And I'm speaking for a field that has uh, right. literally thousands of possible architectures you can make. Um, but I would say a rule of thumb is between about 30 nanometers on the very low side and up to about uh, 300, and 300 or so nanometers on the high side. Uh, depending on on which materials you're looking at, and and again, because our charge extraction is a problem, if you make it thicker and thicker, the charge extraction potentially gets worse and worse. So there's also a balance there of I want to make the layer thicker to get you know the best absorption I can, but I also want to keep it thin enough that I'm able to actually get the charges out at the end of the day. So um, you sort of uh, you're always looking for these little optimums in you know in electrical properties and optical properties, and they always there always tends to be a sort of trade-off that, that you make when you design these devices. Can you put like a, a, a low background voltage across the absorbing material so that you could use a, uh, you know, a different band gap that creates a lower voltage and it would still be acceptable or to move the charges along? Would that something, a scheme like that help? So um, for, for a solar cell to work, um, it always has what's called a built-in voltage. And that just comes from the materials that you're using. Um, so if mm -hmm. I have... You know, basically, if I had a structure that has symmetric contacts on it, it wouldn't it wouldn't know essentially which way the charges are are supposed to go. Um, right. So you always have some asymmetry built into your device, which puts in a built-in voltage, so that um, even if you know, let's say I have the, the contacts short-circuited to each other, and I put light on it, there's going to it's going to force a current through that device, which is why I get current under the sun. And if I apply a certain voltage, such that I stop the current from flowing, that means that um, the light that I'm applying is basically building up a voltage that big. So there's sort of two operating points, one where I have the voltage and all the current, and one where I have no current and all the voltage. Uh, and my, my solar cell is working, in that, working in, that, uh, in that range, and that's how it makes power. Okay, so I guess choosing the, the uh, different organic materials for the junction, you could either choose, a, you'd probably have to choose what smaller gaps for the... So uh, a smaller, a smaller gap would be a more... Yeah, a smaller gap would be uh, a redder absorber or an infrared absorber. So it really depends on the, the part of the spectrum you're targeting. Um, for us, because we are specifically targeting ultraviolet light to make a transparent cell, we're trying to keep the band gaps relatively high. Um, mm -hmm. So we're sort of synthetically working with a class of materials that absorb you know, 400 nanometers and higher energy. So 400 is already very blue close to the UV. Um, so that's that's sort of the, the target spectrum for us. Um, but the really high efficiency people, those groups tend to be absorbing, you know, much, much lower band gap materials. What did you have to modulate the, uh, the band gap throughout the day? Because the nature of the sunlight early morning versus midday versus close to evening changes. It's an interesting idea. So even, even for us, uh, the organics are very, they're very synthetically flexible, but they don't, they don't change once they're made. So the organic is what it is. And the band gap is set, um, Sort of once those once that material combination is made, um, but you definitely will see a change, and this is true of all of all solar cells, um, especially if you know a solar cell that's sitting at a fixed angle rather than tracking the sun, it's always going to change efficiency quite a bit as a function of um, the time of day, and you you see uh, certainly a red shift in the evening and in the morning when you have that, you know, I mean everybody's seen a sunrise and a and a sunset, um, so yeah, you it, it would be interesting to do that, but once the materials are made, they are absorbing where they're absorbing. That's that's sort of the properties we're stuck with. No, I know, but is there a way to do anything about that? Is there any way to uh, to modulate it as the day goes on? No, the, the, the band gap is the band gap, unfortunately. We can't do anything with it. <clears throat> well, since these are clear, I don't know, is there any way to, uh, I guess, pull a shade or have a, a natural shade come down over the window that would have a different band gap where it could take advantage of the, uh, you know, 
the changing daylight. Yes, we we have a different, yeah, a totally different solar cell that that could do that. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, if they're thin if enough, you, then they'd, you know, then why not? Sure, you could. Um, I think, yeah, I gotta, I gotta think about how that would work. Um, but but yeah, you, you could do something like that. In in our case, really, our our, our application is designed um, to drive an electric chromic window. So it, we're trying to make a window that's dimmable. Um, you could have just a you know a totally different solar cell um, that absorbs visible light, and it would look, you know, basically our, ours our visible absorbing cells can look very dark brown or black or purple, um, depending on which part of the spectrum they're getting. So sure, you could do that. Well, how much and of you a have, loss? You have a solar cell for the occasion, right? Yeah. Okay, well, well, how, how much of a loss of efficiency is there, you know, as the daylight changes, a lot or a little or not much? The the, the bigger effect is definitely the angle. Um, so if you sort of mm. like think think about a flat surface and you know look look at a square and then just you know shift the angle so the square is tilting farther and farther away from you, the angle that you can the area of that square that you can see gets smaller and smaller, and that's what's happening to the sun as well. Um, so as you, you know, as you get at those high angles, the solar illumination is really, you know, dropping quite a bit. So, yeah, I guess um, that that doesn't necessarily mean the efficiency of the cell is going down, right? It's still, you know, silicon is still trying to convert 26% of the light into into electricity, but the amount of light that you're getting is is changing a lot. Um, so there there are some small efficiency changes as a function of spectrum. Um, but it's not a not a big effect compared to the effective angle. The small, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so you said there's thousands of different possible materials. What what are some of the ones that uh, seem to work the best that people are moving ahead with for organic solar cells? So the the nomenclature of like what those what those would be called um, is I don't think useful to anybody. Um, so they tend to have these long acronyms based on the, the functional the chemical functional groups that are attached to them. Um, mm. So they they have very long names, um, but they're they're just different uh, different chemicals with different functional groups attached to them in different uh, configurations. So um, I guess to give kind of a general sense, in our part of the spectrum where we're absorbing the UV, we tend to want relatively small molecules. Um, we want the the molecular weights to be as small as we can, not literally as small as we can, but on the smaller side, um, and the the infrared absorbing people tend to want much larger molecules where um, you sort of have the electrons delocalized over these big, uh, long, sort of almost polymeric materials. Um, but I guess the uh, the only one to, to write home about is the one I mentioned before, which is called uh, C60. So that's 60 carbons in a ball. Um, so that, that is a very commonly used material for sort of visible and, and UV absorbing cells. Um, and that's just a very kind of interesting molecule because it is pure carbon in this little weird form factor where it's this closed little it basically looks like a soccer ball right so why is this uh still in the lab how come it's not commercialized yet what's the what's the holdback so i think the as i said the efficiencies have been making a lot of progress recently and that's efficiency for like your main line just absorb as much photon as many photons as you can get as much efficiency as you can that number has been going up really really fast um recently so or organic solar cells were first demonstrated in 1986. They've been around for a really long time. Um, but it wasn't until sort of the, I guess, early, mid-2000s where they really started to garner a lot of research attention and, and um, get pushed as a practical energy source. So efficiency's made a lot of progress. I would say the main drawback right now um, and why you don't see them commercially is probably more reliability. Um, so depending on which material you're using, this varies a lot. You can have some materials that have very, very poor lifetime, and anybody who's you know sort of seen uh, plastic out in the sun for a long time, you, you can sort of get a sense for that. There are plastics that are fantastic out in the sun for a long time and can be very durable, but getting that combination of uh, materials right so that they're going to be stable outdoors is is not easy. And um, the task of sort of keeping your efficiency and your lifetime both very, very high is is a challenge. So I think that's sort of technologically why um, we don't see them yet. And we're also, you know, all of these are industries of scale. So silicon is just this, you know, massive global industry that's got hundreds of factories making this stuff. Um, you know, so there's a lot of process that goes into that um, for you to be able to make solar cells on a, on a large scale and to make them cheaply because, you know, the, the solar industry is 
dollars per watt. How much does it cost to get me this much energy? Right. That's the only thing essentially that that matters in that in that space. Um, and to to get those costs and efficiencies up, you really need to start scaling. Um, so we're kind of trying to prove our technology in terms of efficiency and reliability. And once we do that, then we can start building up the scale. And um, and I, I do think it, it they will be um, a technology that will be competitive, uh, but it is it is a little bit slow getting out of lab right now. And that, that's where we are. Are you going to do it just for Windows or what are some other applications you're looking at? I, I think we can really um, challenge for visible absorbing mainstream um, solar eventually. Um, we're going to start with Windows because it's it's an application that just can't be touched by these other uh, mature inorganic technologies. So if you want to get into a space that silicon can do, it's probably going to beat you. So we want to be um, in a place where there are no other um, competitors. We have you know, sort of a cornered market in the transparent solar space. So I think it's a really good place for organics to begin. Um, and then once we start to build up some of that scale and figure out how to manufacture modules on a, on a larger scale, um, I think, you know, we can sort of build on the progress that's happening right now in the community. We'll, you know, five, 10 years from now, we'll probably have, a, you know, 22, 25% efficient organic solar cell. And if you can make that thing at scale, you can um, certainly compete with silicon and cost once you're, once you're scaled up. Um, and then we, we're, we're left with all these other natural advantages like extreme lightweight. Um, and you can basically print this stuff out like newspaper and just put it on every surface um, with no additional infrastructure required. So I sort of have a, maybe a grander vision for what these solar cells are capable of than, than most do. Uh, but I really do think they'll, um, they will eventually be a, a totally competitive mainstream solar technology with time. Okay. Well, very good. So what's the best way for people to uh, to find out more and to get in touch? Um, yeah. So I think um, this, the stuff I talked about today is stuff that's being worked on at our startup company, and that's Andluca Technologies, uh, A-N-D-L-U-C-A. Um, so you can check us out there. Um, and you can also, um, just for me personally, you can follow me on Twitter at Quinn, Q-U-I-N-N, Burlingame, B-U-R-L-I-N-G-A-M-E. Um, and I, I think that's it. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Quinn, um, right. last question. What do, you, what do you think is possible maybe in the next five years in terms of efficiency and deployment of uh, you know, these transparent solar, organic solar cells? So for the, for the transparent ones, efficiency is not a number um, that we talk about too much because we're sort of self-limiting ourselves to only this tiny little part of the solar spectrum. So I think um, the efficiency, an efficiency that would be great for us is like two to three percent of the total of the total spectrum because that's um, that would mean we're really efficiently harvesting the UV. Um, so I think we will be somewhere in that range, um, and then we're going to be stuck with um, the next sort of challenges of the reliability and the uh, and the scaling. Um, so within five years, I think we'll have certainly a, a very reliable solar cell in the two to three percent efficiency range, and we'll be making uh, solar window inserts that you can buy and regulate the light in your home. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Quinn, thanks for coming on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Yeah, great talk with you, Richard. Thanks. All right, hold on a second. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.